Cyrus Narasta cut his writing teeth in television in the mid-1980s on the hit television series The Equalizer. He parlayed that experience into writing for television series ranging from Falcon Crest to La Femme Nikita to the reboot of Hawaii Five-0, on which he was also a consulting producer. Along the way, Narasta branched out into television and theatrical movies, adapting the best-selling The Advocate's Devil for ABC, and writing and directing The Day Reagan Was Shot for Showtime. Soon after, Steven Spielberg tapped him to write an episode of his epic miniseries Into the West. After that, Narasta produced and wrote the miniseries The Path to 9-11, which was nominated for eight Emmy Awards. Narasta's next film, The Stoning of Soraya M., co-written with his wife Betsy, was the first of three films centered in the Middle East. The second, The Young Messiah, explores the life of Jesus at age seven as his family returns to Nazareth. Now, he returns to the same geography with Infidel, the thrilling story of an American kidnapped while speaking in Cairo, and the tireless efforts of his wife to bring him safely home. You started this. We're gonna finish it. Come on in. He's a good people. I've known Mr. Lucini for some time now. Have you ever seen him exhibit extremist behaviors or attitudes? What? The man's Muslim, so you enter his house without a warrant. Islamophobia! Come with me. He's running a terrorist nerve center or recruitment website. Or am I just an Islamophobe? He won't talk to me anymore. He knows what I saw in that room. Well, what does that tell you? He is the one that said, go to Cairo, talk about the faith. You're not suspicious? I'm asking you, don't go. I will call you. It's gone viral in the Middle East. That you're preaching to Muslims. Well, I was invited. Not by me, mate. Who's there? Don't! He's caused an international incident. He was kidnapped. This is terrorism. You are in the middle of nowhere. And it's going to stay that way. We're green. You got to get him out. They're working on it, right? The, the, the government. Not a chance. The days of Entebbe are long over. As far as the world's concerned, you're dead and buried. I can't give up on it. He's here, your husband. You're CIA. The two of you set him up. They act as if nothing happened in Virginia. Try to get me arrested. I came here to plead for his life. It is clear you are an American spy. I didn't come here to watch you die. We're not afraid to die. That's why we're gonna win. I'm not afraid either. The crew would like to thank Cyrus for coming on the show today. How Cyrus. are you, kind Cheers. sir? <laughs> Great to see you guys. Good to have you on here. Now I'll drink to that again. Mm. Well, let's kind of get into it. So obviously you're in the business of creating entertainment for people, but Infidel kind of feels more than just entertainment uh, for all of us that have seen it. Can you tell us kind of how you were compelled to write this and what you do and what you hope that the American public uh, takes away from this film? Well, you know, first and foremost, I want to do a thriller that's exciting. It's on the edge of your seat. That's suspenseful. And, you know, that's the prime goal. And also to address certain issues, you know, my family, my parents are both from Iran. Um, I lived in Iran as a child. I visited as a young adult. I can't go back now because they don't like my movies. <laughs> the Ayatollahs are film critics. And so, you know, um, I feel there's issues going on with Iran and between Iran and the United States that seem unaddressed. And one of them is the number of Americans who have been either kidnapped or arrested or detained in one fashion or another 
and held over there, held in prison over there. So I thought, boy, maybe there's a thriller in this uh, that sort of keeps us up to date on what's going on. So that was, th those were all parts and pieces of the motivation to, uh, to do this. Yeah. One, one, of, one of the, um, one of the big stars of the, of the, of the movie is vital was uh, James Caviezel. I mean, uh, as the lead uh, uh, of the show character, Doug Rollins, um, how vital was it for you to cast him in that role? Well, quite vital. I mean, I'd worked with Jim before and we had said, let's find something else to work on together. But, you know, part of what the movie addresses is this whole issue of he plays a character who's, who works actually in Northern Virginia, uh, but he's a Christian blogger, okay? And I have actually talked to uh, Christians here in the States who are very active, who get invited commonly to the Middle East to participate in sort of conferences of the Abrahamic religions. And one thing, at least in my experience, and I see this all the time, all the time I've spent in the Middle East, people always ask you, hey, um, you know, I'm talking about the man on the street in the Middle East will say, uh, do you believe in God? What is your religion? Do you go to church? These are big issues over there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've never seen a Middle East thriller that sort of addresses any of that. And I thought, well, this one will be fresh in that we will address it. And, and it's so much better through a character who is a Christian and is a Christian blogger. And of course, the best guy to play that character is Jim Caviezel. Yeah. You know, if you're looking for your A-list movie star who is perfect for this role, it's Jim. And uh, luckily we were able to get him. And uh, he is, you know, when Jim commits to a movie, he commits, you know, 110%. He's great. And, I've, seen some, uh, I've seen some of the other interviews that, that you and, and, and Jim have given. And uh, he's, he's, he's very, um, his convictions come out. Yeah. And, and, and he, he's, he's very, you know, about being a Catholic and about being a Christian and how important that is. And how not to be a quiet uh, a quiet Christian, Christian in in the sense of everything. But there's another character that you had cast, and I, w I was I was hoping you'd be able to tell the story how you, how you came about casting Hal Orzan, or Orzan as oh, Ramsey, the kidnapper. How'd that come about? Well, I was writing the script, and I knew, you know, I'd had a lot of experience. Sort of one year, I'll never forget. This is years ago. I was in London. I was in the London Museum sort of by myself in one section of the museum. And suddenly I found myself surrounded by four or five uh, Middle Eastern guys. Um, you know, they were like, I think they were a mixture of Pakistani and, and uh, Afghan. And they're sitting there, um, they've sort of surrounded me and they start talking to me. They say, hey, where are you from, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And very quickly I realized that these were some very radical cats, okay? Hmm. And one of the British guys uh, with a British accent, one of the Pakistani guys with a very distinct British accent, said to me, you know, there's huge advantage to a guy like you in our cause because you speak uh, English like, a, like, a, like an American, like a native, the way I speak, you know, in my accent, et cetera. So the, and, I, and of course, I just played it cool and said, yeah, yeah, I get you guys. Yeah, that's great. I got to go. Um, so I've always wanted to do a character who grew up in London, who has these Middle Eastern convictions, these extremist convictions. Right. So I'm writing the East London accent. I get him while I'm writing the script, I got invited to a cigar party in the Valley <clears throat> and we're in the backyard and I hear some guy 20 feet behind me talking in this East London accent, really loud and obnoxious. <laughs> And so, <laughs> is it any like other that. way? <laughs> and, I, and I turn around and look at him, and I thought, boy, this this guy looks like he's from the Middle East or that part of the world. And there were a lot of people in the business there, and I thought, he's got to be an actor. Uh, so I went over and started talking to him, just chatting, didn't mention anything about the movie or what I was doing, and discovered he had been an actor, but he hadn't acted for years. He was uh, focusing more on television uh, writing. Uh, now and I left that party convinced this is the guy because he had 
there was something dangerous about him, kind of edgy yeah. uh, and confrontational, but at the same time appealing. He had a charisma about him. Uh, he was funny. And I thought, this guy'd be perfect. And um, I talked to our casting people and said, this is the guy I want. So um, he didn't have to audition or anything. He was it. And, did, um, did he push back? Was he like, nah, no, I don't want to necessarily do it? Or did he jump at the chance? Once he read the script, he recognized it was a good part. He was all in. Yeah. Awesome. Before I move on to my next question, I wanted to go back to Chris's first question about Jim Caviezel. One of the things that kind of struck me as I was watching it was that to be a Christian, an out Christian, if you will, in Hollywood is a risk. It's, it's something that you, you know, when you speak your convictions, um, you're risking, you know, maybe not getting hired for a job here and there. And to me, even though the risk of the character were so much more significant when he was, you know, on that interview, speaking his convictions, I kind of thought that that was an interesting parallel between Caviezel's mm -hmm. real experience in Hollywood versus the experience of that character, as far as the, the risk of, of expressing your faith. No doubt. No doubt. Jim has lived it. Um, you know, the passion of the Christ was rejected by every studio and distributor around. Yeah. Um, he goes on, uh, they go on to make the movie that makes, you know, it's one of the most successful films ever. I mean, it made like a right. billion dollars. And then Mel Gibson went into his spiral mm -hmm. and that didn't help. And, you know, look, uh, Jim is, you know, he was on a certain track where he was really flying and then it stalled for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but he's very selective now about what he does. Now, one of the things I love about Jim is, you know, like he said this on one of the interviews he did, he goes, uh, this isn't some candy ass Christian film. Right. And I loved him for that because it's not, this is not a Christian no. film. No, no. I wanted that context because that's the truth and the reality of, especially how the man on the street in the Middle East looks at America, the West, the interactions, et cetera. And I thought it would be, you know, David Morrell wrote me a note, he saw the movie and he said, you know, that was really fresh to look at it from that perspective. And um, so that was really the angle there. And, uh, but fundamentally, you know, it's a thriller, but it has that context. Yeah, it's a thriller yeah. through and through. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, and, and, and talking about the things that, that are different and talking about your writing and the kind of character you were creating with uh, Ramsey, um, one of the things that I uh, was really strongly felt is that neither of the leads, the protagonist or the antagonist, were at all an archetype, a standard archetype. Doug Rollins was devout, but he wasn't a saint. And he wasn't unshakable when he was in captivity. You know, he he, he wasn't overtly like, you know, chin up brave when when things were happening to him and then R ramsey was not a religious zealot uh it, it really he was more a man angered by his mistreatment at the hands of Amer americans and what he considered in grave injustices and then the people who aid them were a mix of muslims a mix of christians and a mix of jews which was you know again so was this central to your theme when you were writing it in addition to the action thing where it was part of it you know to kind of break those those molds that we that we've seen so many times. Sure, I mean, and a lot of it has to do with what I sort of have witnessed myself in the Middle East. You know, I mean, I've, I've traveled throughout the Middle East. I chase money in the Emirates. I, you know, I've been spent time in Egypt, uh, lived in Iran, made two movies in Jordan, made a mini series in Morocco. So I'm all over the place there, and it's just truer to sort of my experience of the Middle East, um, which I, I felt like was not evident in a lot of the movies I was seeing. Hmm. So, you know, I think that, look, there's a lot to this movie. And I think a lot of the reviewers that I've read, we've gotten generally favorable reviews. They're kind of thrown by some of the stuff they're, they're hit with in this movie. They, yeah. they, they're, 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 some of the views are kind of schizophrenic in that sense. Yeah. Hmm. I, I think one of, the, one of the small scenes with Caviezel that I, I kind of speaks to what I was talking about is, you know, you, he comes, he's this very serious, uh, you know, blogger who's going to go over and have this very serious conversation with Egypt. But the, the moment with his wife, just where she's kind of 
making fun of him in a sense, you know, and, and just his ability to laugh at himself and, you know, and not take himself too seriously, even though he has these serious convictions. I thought that was a really, a, a really effective scene for me um, as far as creating that character, you yeah. know, and making, making him a three dimensional, a real character and not a, not a. No, I mean, that moment is important. You're talking about when they reunite in the, in, in, in the visiting room there. Right. In the prison. Yeah. That's a critical moment in the film because he basically apologizes to her for what he's done. Mm-hmm. Right. And very few of the reviewers have sort of even commented on that. Hmm. You know? and, and then she kind of justifies him, which is really right. what happens when yeah. couples, you know, sort of reunite like that and are trying to bolster one another up. Yeah. Well, you know, I was looking at your career as a whole up to this point. Um, and it's, it kind of has some interesting aspect to it from from an outsider's look. I mean, you started off with the Equalizer, which was man, I I love that movie. <laughs> I love that show. <laughs> I watched it every week. You did Falcon Crest, DEA, La Femme Nikita, and then it just kind of jumps out at me right around two thousand two thousand and one. You do some pretty meaty subject matter. You know, the day Reagan was shot with Richard Dreyfuss and awesome. And, and Oliver Stone, then Path to 9-11, the stoning of Soria. Um, Soria. Um, it, it seems to me that there was some progression there, and I don't know if it was purposeful or was this kind of happenstance that you've kind of gone from television series to some pretty significant and serious uh, subject matter. Well, it's sort of just, uh, I, I think, the progression of one's career, you know, the first thing you got to do, and I, and Sean, you worked in Hollywood, so you understand what I'm talking about. You got to make a living doing this. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Pay the bills. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and you got to get established. Um, and writing for those television shows, uh, especially uh, developing the pilot and the show La Femme Nikita, which went on to be a hit show for like, yeah. I don't know, five years. Five years, yeah. You get a little bit more, what's the word, clout, I guess. Mm-hmm. And now, I'm at a position where I can try to sort of push my own thing, the kinds of things that I like to do or I like to watch. And that's where uh, I started to go in the direction of the day Reagan was shot. And, you know, that plays as a thriller uh, in, in many ways. And I was able to just, you know, I wrote that, I, I pissed it, I couldn't sell it. And then I wrote it on spec over the Christmas holiday because I had nothing else to do. Hmm. So um, I'd done all that research. I, you know, I figured it out and I thought, hell, I'll just write it. So I wrote it and then suddenly everybody wanted the script. <laughs> and uh, I got offered a lot of money for it, but essentially I decided, you know what, I want to direct. And um, Oliver Stone wanted to do it. But I asked Oliver, I said, is this your next movie? And he says, no, uh, I got this other movie I'm going to do. And I said, well, I can't wait. And then he goes, well, how can I help you? And I said, you produce it. And he did. And Oliver really stepped up for me. And um, so we got that made. It's still the highest rated two hour movie Showtime's ever done. What? And it's, you know, it, it was great uh, for me, for my career. So then I started to be the guy that people would go to for a lot of docudrama type stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, when, when they brought, you know, I, 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 when they brought me, uh, ABC brought me uh, the path to 9-11. Uh, that was huge because mm. it was a two-night miniseries, a $40 million thing. Wow. We were in competition with another network, and we had to move. And the other, the other network had like three or four writers on it, and then they called me in. They said, gee, we're kind of concerned. Maybe we'll, we'll get some other writers to support you. And I said, guys, he travels fastest who travels alone. I will beat them. And uh, I did. So we, we got it made. It was, an, it was kind of the perfect storm in terms of how it got made. Because we were in a race, it's like they couldn't futz with the scripts too much. I mean, Sean, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everybody thinks they're a writer. So it's like uh, you get you know, reams of notes, and it, they didn't have time for that. The only people who could really look at it were the lawyers. Because I had to, give an annot- I had to provide an annotated draft. So it gets made. And then the perfect storm continues, but now in a negative sense, mm. in that we uh, screened it at the uh, National Press Club three weeks before it was to air. 
and it was like, I don't know, 1,200 people there watching it. And of course, there were a number of tables that were the Clintonistas. And they were outraged because we dramatized his opportunities to get bin Laden pre 9 11. Mm -hmm. So they resolved, they walked out of there that night, resolved to get this thing pulled from the air. Jeez. And uh, they came this close to getting it pulled entirely, but they forced Disney ABC to cut three minutes out of it, which is the scenes where, you know, Clinton is refusing to give the green light to hit Bin Laden, yeah. which they were claiming, which the pre and the media jumped on this, and the media is claiming, I made all this stuff up. Now yeah. it's like, it's like a given historical fact. We know right. how many hours. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but you have a lot of power. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was, it was huge for me in negative ways and in positive ways. And it sort of transformed my career in the sense that I said, you know what, I'm going to stick with directing now and I'm going to do my babies and get them made wherever I can and find the money myself. And that was it. That was a kind of a crucible, uh, you know, experience for me. Yeah. So I heard you mention in other interviews that you wanted or or you rather needed to film this movie in the Middle East because it adds so much to everyone from the cast, the crew, and to the viewers who end up watching it on the big screen. Uh, I know you were able for a time to keep your shooting location uh, in Jordan under wraps, but eventually uh, the Iranian government found out. Yeah. That regime already didn't like you because of a, the other movie you, you directed, uh, The Stoning of Soraya M., Right. Um, so did you have to take extra security precautions and did you have to deal with any security concerns during the filming? Well, yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, the stoning of Soraya M was condemned and banned by the Iranian right. government. It became a crime to own a copy. I know people who wow. were, have been in prison because of having a copy and it eventually was part of the reason why? Because it became this bootleg underground underground thing. thing. Yeah, I, I uh, heard about that. It, it became, uh, I think, uh, somewhat responsible for them uh, putting a moratorium on stoning. But with this film, because I'm going back to Jordan, they didn't want me to say where we were filming, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, the Iranians found out. They expressed their dissatisfaction to the uh, Jordanian government. We had uh, heavy duty security, um, mostly for my uh, actors. Um, and, you know, we got through it. I mean, the Jordan, Jordanian government, their Jordanian intelligence service is one of the best in yeah. the region. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're the GID, I'm not sure. And they're really good. And they know what's going on. They keep an eye on the Iranian embassy very closely, you know, because all of those Arab countries are very suspicious of Iran. Yeah. Very cautious. Were, were, you, we, ever, uh, were you ever uh, nervous or worried that because you had angered the Ayatollahs, that something may happen? Um, not while I was there filming. Um, when I got back after doing stoning and after we bootlegged it inside the country, um, <laughs> I got a lot of nasty uh, messages and, you know, nonsense. That I, became a real thing though. The bootlegging of, of that movie all throughout, um, yeah. you know, like the churches and whatnot that aren't supposed to exist in Iran, but that became a real thing. Yeah, no, it, it, it did. And look, I, you know, I, I, I know a few guys in that world, you know, uh, who would tell me, you know, they were talking about you in Parliament. <laughs> the Iranian Parliament. Not, How did you know you made it, though, Cyrus? Not, they're giving your movie a definite thumbs down. So That's so, a yeah. win. That's a win. Yeah, I made the mistake. Uh, you know, I don't read or, or write Farsi. I can speak it a bit. I made the mistake of forwarding a Farsi email to my father. Oh. And it just freaked him out. And uh, But, you know... It's fine. It, 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 it helped me get a license to carry in Southern California. It's very difficult. <laughs> you could probably get one in D.C. then. That's amazing. <laughs> Maybe. Well, Maybe since, we're, even. since we're talking about the people you pissed off, um, <laughs> you, you have the uh, unique distinction of being accused for liberal bias for the film The Day Reagan Was Shot and conservative bias for The Path to 9-11. Uh, I had an early mentor that once told me that if I was irritating both sides and it was a good sign I was being honest. Um, 
So now nobody has a monopoly on the truth, but do you think that controversy you've been associated with has to do with people chafing at uncomfortable truths? Absolutely. I mean, the path to 9-11 was critical of both sides of the political aisle in the lead up to 9-11. It's, mm -hmm. it's just that Clinton had a lot more time. Yeah. He had eight years and right. Bush had like eight and a half months, right? <laughs> so yeah. of course we, we focus on that more, but it was, it was only one side, it was the Clinton apologists who got upset. Right. So look, we, when, when people get that upset, you know you've scratched something <laughs> deep. And um, you know, yeah, the members of the right did get upset with the day Reagan was shot, but it was nothing like what I got hit with on Path to 9-11. Um, hmm. You know, it's just, uh, it's okay, because I think controversy helps. I mean, I, I, I really do. It's not like I was intending to be controversial. We were naive enough to think that, oh, everybody's going to love Path to 9-11. Aren't we wonderful? <laughs> but then we got Tyrus, everything is political all the time. <laughs> oh, you're right. You're right. Everything. And um, so it's not like we intend it, but you can't also shy away from it. You can't think to yourself, well, if I go into this thing in my story, it's going to cause X, Y, or Z, because then you're frozen. Yeah. Oh, true. Why do you think Jordan was uh, willing to allow you to film now two of, of, of your big features um, you know, that deal with rights abuses with the Iranian political regime? Are, are you, were you aware of any repercussions that was caused uh, between the two countries uh, with your allowance to be there? Well, not really. I don't think the two countries are that close anyway. Yeah. Uh, Jordan is trying to uh, attract film business there. They're, they're one of the few countries in the region that doesn't have any oil. Uh, oh. it's, a, it's a poor country. So, um, you know, they're trying to attract film business. Yeah. So, um, Mike, Sean, and I, we, we, we've talked amongst ourselves about Iran and the fact that a vast majority of the populace, our opinion, don't want these conflicts and desire actually a positive relationship with the West. I mean, I have, I have coworkers and friends who are Persians, they call themselves Persians instead of like Iranians. Right. With that in mind, do you think Iran will, will move away from a theocracy and move toward a democratic form of government within our lifetimes? Uh, I hope so, and I think so. I think it's possible. Hmm. I, I just don't think Iran, I mean, Islam came relatively late right. to Iran, and it came via the sword. Right. Um, now, it still is going to have this pocket of influence uh, and, and this circle that's very committed to it. But I think a lot has changed in the last 40 years with these guys. I think they went further than people expected. Uh, they're far worse than Shaw ever was, and the Shaw was not perfect. Um, the, Shaw, the Shaw blew it, essentially. Mm -hmm. He had a real opportunity. But... You know, a lot of the Arab countries are much more tied into the uh, cultural traditions of Islam, whereas Iran is not. Yeah. Uh, Iran is as this ancient Persian culture and yeah. heritage, and it's a very colorful, rich tapestry that most Iranians identify themselves with, you know, that I talk to anyway. Hmm. What, what I find interesting is, is um, I mean, there have been posts on Facebook that have made the rounds of pre Ayatollah 1970s uh, Iran and you look at the pictures and it's you know it could be Southern California yeah it looks like California the way people are dressing the people way you know the yeah. women are dressed where everyone's doing and, and you just it you know to someone who you know I'm in my 40s so I'm just dumbfounded how how quickly it changed like like that almost um, yeah. where you, it's kind of gone the other direction and I hope um, that there is in like an internal revolution. It's got to come from the younger, the younger generation. It's got to come from the people that they, they push that religious theology out, yeah, no, out no. of the, of the government. Look, I think, I, I think you're right. I, I agree with you. It has to come from within. Um, but, you know, I also think, you know, we had sort of policy directions in this country, which were more for sort of like domestic political benefit um, that, 
I know a, a lot of Iranians object to, which is, you know, this whole nuclear deal and all this stuff was really just, let's, these guys want, we're going to take billions of dollars. We're going to help prop them up and keep them in power. That's right. what that, and that's how most Iranians saw it. Yeah. It was basically, this was an initiative to keep the Ayatollahs in control. That's yeah, how they perceived it. That always dumbfounded. Yeah, I look at that deal and I just have to shake my head. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you were directing Infidel, did it affect you in a, in a personal way, in any way? And, you know, were, or, and were you concerned about any public or international reactions to the film? Well, you know, these are touchy subjects, you know, uh, yeah. dealing with a, with a Christian blogger who gets kidnapped by Hezbollah, um, who's, you know, taken to Iran and put on trial for spying. We're dealing with also an underground Christian movement in Iran, which is true, which is primarily led by women. So these are all touchy subjects. No, there, I don't think there's a movie that's addressed the Christian underground in Iran, which is getting bigger and bigger as we speak. So, and, and it's part of a movement among also Muslims and others who, who are against the regime. Yeah. But look, these are all touchy subjects. Um, but I, I thought it made for a fresh backdrop for a thriller that I think is pertinent and contemporary. And, uh, you know, as a, as a filmmaker and a storyteller, you want to explore that stuff. That's, it's right it's, there and matters, you know? Right, exactly. It's very current, very current as well. I'm, I mentioned this earlier in my other question, but I, I love, I think one of the most important things to bring balance to, to that sh story that a lot of stories don't have is you, you had the Muslim prison guard who was working in, con you know, in concert to help them out. And I, again, we, everything, it's, it's very much a us against them. It's, it's black and white, you know, in, in film often. And, and this was, there was a lot of shades of gray in, in the, the more, the moral questions were black and white, but the, the gray was in the, the, the people that were in it. You know, there were, there was definitely, I, I just thought there was a lot more depth to it than the average thriller. So commend you Good. on that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, we've talked about your goals for Infidel. We've taught the progression of your career, Mike brought up earlier. Um, what, what about going forward? What's next for um, Cyrus Narasta? Well, I've got, you know, like everybody, I mean, you know, the deal, Sean, you got to, you got to uh, prepare and develop a lot of stuff and throw them all against the wall and see what sticks. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you, look for par you look for partners, you look for uh, producers that can help and you look for money. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I found out fairly late in life around age 50 that I'm better at getting people <laughs> to write checks than I ever thought. Ooh, <laughs> <You're> <laughs> <a> politician. <laughs> yeah. When I was young, you know, my, my father-in-law, uh, he used to say to me, oh, you should be in sales. You're really good. You should be in sales. Yeah, you, you. <laughs> And I used to think, he's, he's, he's got to be on crack. So um, <laughs> sure enough, I found out I'm better at raising money than I thought. And um, that helps me that way I'm not sitting around here in my office waiting for the phone to ring. Right. Yeah. You know, I can, I can sort of be more proactive and it certainly helps that I write, produce and direct, you know, so um, I, I got People projects. Look, look up your own ass. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And it, be an entrepreneur, you know, it's just like, that's what it's about. Yeah. And um <clears throat> So I have yeah, more, I things have I more doors to. opened up, Cyrus, from this movie? It depends. This is not a Hollywood mainstream movie. My friends in, I, I live in Camarillo, north of LA. My friend's about an hour from here. You know, look, there's an executive producer in this movie by the name of Dinesh D'Souza. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not real popular in Hollywood political circles. Right. Right. He's conservative. Uh -huh. And, yeah, and I've already got my own problems because some of the stuff I've done. So it's like, it's not as if people are going to say, gee, can you get us a meeting with Dinesh? <laughs> I don't think George sure. Clooney's going to be calling me on that one. So, no. you know, I, I haven't really relied on mainstream Hollywood necessarily, although there are a lot of people there who I think, you know, we might be able to find common ground on things to do. But I try to do my own thing and, you know, we'll see. Uh, 
the problem is the business is so contracted because of the lockdown. And right. There's so little development going on. It's like nobody's doing anything. Right. Um, really, everybody's just sitting around waiting, uh, either either to contract the virus or you know <laughs> get a vaccine. So yeah, you know, so me, I'm promoting my movie. <laughs> well, to your, to your last point, one thing I contend, and actually the passion of the Christ is is given a here, is that Hollywood has really strong ideologies, but the top ideology is profit. Yeah, it's money. And, right, you know, nobody wanted to do religious movies until The Passion of the Christ. And then next thing you know, Fox has Fox Faith. I mm-hmm. think Sony had a, a, a faith, you know, division. And so I think that, you know, w- when when something becomes uh, fi- fiscally successful, suddenly uh, the ideology changes a little bit, or the willingness to at least explore yeah. new subject matter. So given the budget that you were that you were working with, and again, the product looks like, 30 million bucks easy yeah, least. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's success does open those doors because, uh, like, you know, I mean, to me, you're, you're a pretty safe bet given what you've done with that budget. Yeah. Well, thank you. No, I, you know, I'm chasing down, I'm trying to chase down right now uh, a story I want to do. That's this fame, this big case. I can't really talk about it, but um, because the right, I haven't secured the rights yet, mm. but it's a case of a general, and you'd probably be able to figure it out. Uh, mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, who's been in the news. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think it's a great movie. Uh, I think it's a great movie. I think it's the same audience that we've gotten strong numbers from on Infidel. I think Ooh. it's a great story. Yeah. It's a court case. It's, you know, it's in the name of the father. It's Aaron Brockovich. It's whatever. Mm. Those kinds of, cl- in that classic movie uh, tradition, A Few Good Men. And um, so... I'm chasing that down. I've got a couple other scripts I want to do. And, you know, if you can do movies for a price, I I, I really think that's the ticket down the line because I think we're at a real dividing point in the same way that the strike of 2007 and eight was a dividing point in our business and changed a lot of what was going on in town. Mm -hmm. I think that we know what the streaming has done, but I think now this COVID thing, which I think is going to affect, uh, you know, theater attendance for a long time. Yeah. And I think what that means is that your standard hundred million dollar plus tentpole comic book movie is, you know, not going to get the numbers they have to have to survive mm-hmm. at that level. And it's, I think it's going to yield room for smaller, more interesting stuff. Uh, I hope so anyway. And look, we're living in kind of crazy times. It reminds me of the 60s and 70s, what's going on right now, yeah. you know, huh. with, the, with the rioting and the craziness and all of it. So I think right. we, may, we may be on the cusp of a lot of interesting movies uh, coming down the pike. We're, Cyrus, where do you think that the, the cuts come, do you, um, you know, budget-wise? Do you think it comes from, from the actor's pay? Do you, like, where, where's the, you know, it's got to be cut somewhere. Some of that fat, where's it come from? Yeah, but, but, you know, this business has been thriving on a lot of fat. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's not like we're having to search for the fat. Uh, <laughs> <believe me. laughs> so I, I think, look, um, free planning is key. I like to keep my crew smaller. Stanley Kubrick used to have notoriously small crews. Huh. He didn't want all these people around. And neither do I. One of them might be carrying a gun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I think that um, actors are willing to work for less than their normal fee um, if they feel the movie's worth it, that the part is worth it, and they're working with someone they trust. Um, so it goes all the way down the line, including the filmmaker. So it's, you know, and, and, and you know, I try to give my investors a real shot. I, I never come to them and say, hey, you're going to make a ton of dough on this movie about a woman who gets stoned to death. Um, I, you know, I just tell them, look, if you are allied with the mission of this movie, what it's about and what it has to say, and you believe that's important enough to get it out there, let's get into business together. I, I don't make big promises on returns. And um, I think, I think infidel already because of the, small budget, I think we got a real chance for our investors uh, to be smiling at the end of the day. Well, it's always a good thing. Yeah. Um, I, I got a quick question though. 
how long did it take you to actually film in Fidel? Uh, 35, 35 shooting days, which is actually pretty good. Very, that's, that's very that's good. That's awesome. Wow, that's impressive. Holy right, so, I mean, if you were to shoot a movie of that equivalent budget, say, in the States, you'd have to shoot it in 18 to 22 days. And I get more days because the crews and everything else and the locations uh, cost so much less shooting over there. Hmm. And I, as a director, um, for me, the most important thing is I want to have the time to deliver the action and, and, and the days to deliver the movie uh, in quality wise. So I fight for days more than anything. Wow. That's amazing. I, <laughs> the budget you had, the timing, I mean, is that going to be the norm shooting in these uh, 45 day windows? Do you think down the road or is? Well, yeah, 45 days I'd like on my next one. No, I, I had like 40 <laughs> on my previous, my previous movie to this was a, was a studio movie, the young Messiah based on the, Oh my gosh. Album. Yeah. Yeah. And I did that. I think in like 40 or 41 days in Italy. What an awesome story, by the way. Because well, it's a story that is like never told. Uh, and it was based on, uh, you know, the Anne, Anne Rice book, right? And Anne um, Rice bestseller about right. Jesus at age seven. And it's really a family story. It's like, it's unlike any, you know, I mean, that, I love that movie. I'm very proud of that movie and changed my life in many ways. But, you know, this is the problem. This is why, in a way, I prefer doing it independently because you're working for a studio. So, okay, we're making this big movie. I think that one, the budget on that was like 18 million, did it in Italy. And then everybody we worked with for two years at the studio got fired 10 weeks before the movie came out. What? So they all got fired, all these people we developed. So now these new guys come in, they care less about our movie. Yeah, right. They, you know, they, 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 they dumped, got no skin in the game. Exactly. They dumped us on the market. We were gone in a couple of weeks. And when you spend that much time on something, it's like, oh. And that only happens in a studio situation. See, as an independent, we're, we're, we're actually, we had choices here. We were talking to Entertainment One. We were talking to Lionsgate. We were talking to Cloudburst, which is, a, which is partnered with Universal. And then we ended up making a deal with Cloudburst. But we can sort of navigate and figure out where we want to be and the terms under which we want to be there. Interesting. And whereas if you're a studio movie, you're a slave to the studio. Yeah. No, it was funny though because I wanted to. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a Catholic, and we read the Bible every night to my young children. And ha knowing that this this interview was coming up with you, and doing some research and background on you, I was like, "Holy crap! This would be a great movie for my children to watch." To me, with me, my wife, and my kids all together, because it is a family movie. How so, old are they? Thank you. Uh, Ten and eight. Oh yeah, they're getting close to the right age. Right. Absolutely. Aren't all Anne Rice books a family movie? No, just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> Only a couple. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have survived the main portion of Cheers. the Career Views interview, so that deserves in and of itself a little sippy sippy here. And we're getting ready to enter in what's called the lightning round. And this is the period of time where you no longer should think before you speak you should actually speak off the cuff without any thought process whatsoever please do and so since i'm the host today i will go first so my first question is why are people born in colorado the greatest humans on earth uh because there's a lot of buffaloes there <laughs> <laughs> i have no idea me neither. I just thought I had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Are, are you born in Colorado too? Is that why? I, is that no, no, I live here, but I wasn't born here. <laughs> oh, you weren't. No, I wasn't from. Born. I'm from Iowa. Right? I'm a little yeah, Iowa boy. Yeah. All right. Corn question food. two. Your beautiful wife Betsy. When was the moment you knew she was the one? Wow. Uh... When I heard her tell a story about a bullfight she'd watched in Spain to a group of people at a party one night, and I was standing back and listening to her story, and I thought, this is really a cool chick, man. This take on this bullfight is un was completely unexpected and unlike anything I'd ever heard. So uh, that, that was it. I mean, I felt like, wow. I wasn't, oh. even I wasn't even dating her then. Oh, wow. Wow, no kidding. Well, so he, he knew ahead of time. What was her take on the bullfight? <laughs> She just thought it was a religious experience. So it was one of the most amazing things she ever saw. And she described it in detail. And the guy ended up dying. And it's just like, oh, she, wow. 
she just you know and of course you hear the standard things ah this pagan ritual right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, that, the way they treat the bulls and of course she said well the bulls wouldn't even be alive if it weren't for the bullfight because they breed them for it all right <laughs> She got an you can't answer make up it. that story, by the way. That's real. We know that's real. You can't make that up. All right. Question number three. Okay. And let's ignore the fact that my wife has a huge crush on Jim Caviezel. All right. So how many times can I legally vote for Claudia as best supporting actress for her role as Elizabeth Rollins in The Infidel? She was amazing. Yeah. She was amazing as many times as you want, but you got to be an Academy member. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and also, I, I don't know if we've even got money in our budget for an Oscar campaign, although I think she's wonderful in the movie. So, and as far as, you know, people having crushes on Jim Caviezel, you know, I, suddenly I'm getting all these new uh, Twitter followers, you know, <laughs> I mean, by the hundreds. And they're That's all women. Awesome. Okay. You see my wife. I thought, but yeah, she's I, thought, one of them. Gee, I, I thought, gee, I'll have to show this to Betsy. You see all these women who are following me now. Well, all of them want me to connect them with Jim Caviezel. Sure. <laughs> sure. You're, you're a conduit. Come on, Cyrus. You're a the conduit. Man. You, you should, Jim needs a wingman. Yeah. We should collaborate on a social media Oscar campaign because, uh, yeah. She, Jim Caviezel doesn't have social media. I think he has Instagram. I'm talking about. I'm talking about Cyrus. Uh, oh, yeah. For, for the for the movie, because yeah. it's like that's, no. they are expensive. No, honestly, I don't. Not a chance. <laughs> not a prayer. Not not with Dinesh and me involved. <laughs> it ain't happening. <laughs> well, we'll do a virtual vote for her. That's right. And I don't know. Is is was that really a supporting actress or, or support? Or, well, it's, it's a lead actress. Yeah, a lead. Yeah, a actress. Yeah, I right. I She's I'm like the Merle Streep of Australia. Yeah. Oh, she's yeah. She's really well respected over there. She does a ton of stuff in Australia. Yeah. It was Amazing. a phenomenal job. And there came she was a there last came... minute replacement. Right. I, I had that. another actress. And like a week and a half before, uh, she says, oh, I got an opportunity to direct. I'm going to direct this, this thing. And I said, what are you directing? I thought she was going to direct a big movie or something. So I'm going to direct an episode of some show. I said, are you kidding me? What? You're bailing on my movie to go direct an episode? I said, I've done that. It's, it's a waste of time. It kind of turned out OK. <laughs> well, we're, it worked out well, because and her chemistry with Caviezel were, was great. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, awesome. they knew each other before, right? Yeah, they yeah. worked together before. He recommended her. So the movie gods were with us. Awesome. Nice. All right. All right. Speaking of gods, uh, what's your favorite story of Jesus's life? Wow. Well, you know, the most unique story is sort of um, the one we used at the opening of the young Messiah. And it's from the, uh, what do you call them? Uh, Gnostic? The apocryphal. Yeah. Apoc the Gnostic. Apocryphal. It's from the apocrypha. But it's the story of, uh, of the kid um, who he has a confrontation with, and the kid dies, and he brings him back to life. Mm -hmm. And that's from the Apocrypha. That's how she opened her, uh, her book, and that's how we opened the movie. And uh, it's set in Alexandria. And, and looking back at all of the sort of the history in, uh, in Alexandria and going back to the Coptic uh, kind of Christians, you, you hear all these stories about the family and about young Jesus when he was a child growing up in Alexandria that go back thousands of years. I find that all fascinating. As, as do I. Um, so it, this is a little bit of a deeper question. Uh, we're, we're all fathers. We, have, we all have sons. Uh, what is the most important thing a father can pass to his sons or daughters in life? Well, some of us are actually grandfathers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old enough. I don't have. <laughs> I don't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, Mike. Mike, congrats. <laughs> <laughs> My 15 year old. What? <laughs> what? I think the most important thing we can pass on is uh, how to raise their children, hopefully the, in the fashion that they were raised, if that was good. Yeah. That way, <clears throat> um, you know how to be a father. I think that's kind of the most important job we have. Just setting yeah. a great example for the yeah. next generation. Yeah, so sure. no, no, no greater job. That's why I tell my children, I, I left the, I left my previous job to be a better father to them. I did this around. Right. Um, my last question, if tomorrow was your last day on earth and you couldn't spend it with family or friends, what would you do? Wow. <laughs> I'd probably, uh, go play tennis. 
<laughs> I love it. I, I, would have it. I mean, I, I, played, I went to college on tennis scholarships, so I love to get out and play. <sighs> still. And I go out and play for a couple of hours and work up a big sweat, and I'm never happier because no matter what's going on, I can sort of whack the ball and get competitive and uh, walk off there very, you know, sort of satisfied and go on to the next. It kind of, it's a kind of therapy for me. Yeah, I can well, see that. Interesting sure. answer. Well, my questions are not nearly as deep as this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> what is the most absurd script note you have received? Put a dog in it. People like dogs. <laughs> Okay. This is a recipe. I bet you could. I bet you could pull Hollywood screenwriters, and I bet eighty percent of them would have a dog-related uh, script <laughs> note at some point. Um, okay, that's so crazy. And Sean, that's a great idea for a book. No, I'm serious. It's yeah. like a collection of the stupidest notes that, that is a great you've idea. received in Hollywood. Because this is an area that a lot of writers don't want to touch, really, because they're worried. Oh shit, I might have to work with that person that's right. in oh. the future. But, you know, producers have no compunction about sitting around talking about writers <laughs> who uh, made mistakes or didn't follow what they wanted or whatever, you know, right. who were in the ass. And, um, yeah, it's I, – I think I can – I've been working in this business 35 years. I think I can count on one hand the number of people who have actually helped, make, helped me make a script better. Yeah, I, I, I believe <laughs> wow. that's true. I believe that's, that's true. Brutal. All right, you're a well-traveled soul. What is your favorite city in the Mideast? Ah, interesting. You know, I, you know, I, 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 I was fascinated by Cairo. I think Cairo is just an incredible place. It's a scary place, but it's also, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's just... It's, there's some, there's a dynamism and electricity then, and, and, and a lot of other things in the air <laughs> there that I think are fascinating. And uh, I'm also partial to Amman because I, I made two movies in Jordan, you know, and that, that's important to me. So. Awesome. <clears throat> okay. My last question. So as someone who came of age in seventies, Wisconsin, <laughs> how accurate of portrayal was that 70s show? <laughs> mm. It's pretty good. <laughs> I, 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 thought, I thought it was pretty good. That wasn't my family, but it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> and the, the dad was my dad at times. Uh, yeah. All right, Cyrus. My dad was worse. Survived <laughs> the lightning round. Uh, good job. Thank you, sir. We want to toast to you and everybody go out and see The Infidel. The movie is spectacular. And the fact that you shot it in such a short period of time on that budget says a lot of what you're able to put out there with such small resources. So congratulations to you. It's a wonderful yeah. show. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. I really appreciate it. And, and to echo uh, Jim Caviezel, it's no candy ass Christmas, Christmas movie. It's a, <laughs> no, it's a thriller through and through. That's you, right. you're, you'll enjoy it. This Cheers. audience will love this movie. The crew would like to thank Cyrus Narasta for coming on the show today. His new film, The Infidel, is out, and it is phenomenal. Please can see this uh, movie, people. It is fantastic, and the acting is spectacular. And join us every Monday for a new show with best-selling guests. Or directors. And directors now. And he wrote. So. Anyway, mud in your eye, gentlemen. Good show. Crew reviews, buddy. Mm -hmm. I got you. Mike's in a Rastafarian. Thank Cyrus Norstad for coming on the crew today. All right, the crew would like to thank Mr. Cyrus Norstad for coming on the show today. The crew would like to thank Mr. Cyrus Norstad for coming on the show today. <laughs> I'm never making it onto any of the sets of his movies ever again. No. <laughs> Security. <laughs> I, Rasta. No, I shouldn't Rasta. drink before the show. <laughs> Pro for Cyrus Narasta. Ooh, I said it right. What you won't do? <clears throat> I won't do it live though. <clears throat> The crew would like to thank Cyrus Narasta for coming on the show today and his new film, The Infidel, which the three of us have actually seen and it is fantastic. Seriously, an under budget 
And okay, I just went off. Oh, the look good, at you! <clears throat> Damn it! I heard Dude. a little squealing of the rear tires, and then I listened to it, and then I stopped driving. Take, ah, whatever. And yeah, yeah, yeah. The crew would like to thank Cyrus Norasta for coming on the show today. His new film, The Infidel, is coming out, and it it's already out. I don't know what I'm saying. All right. <laughs> All right. The crew would like to thank Mr. Cyrus Norasta for coming on the show today. Norasta. 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 <laughs> Norasta. I said that right, didn't I? Norasta. 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 <laughs>